Thanks, Mauricio. Uh, good evening, everyone. It is my pleasure to introduce Simon Scott. Simon came to Canada from Britain in the mid-1960s as a recent graduate architect. He soon joined the firm Arthur Erickson Architects. Then, in the early 1970s, he spent a couple of years in Rome working on photography and the design of a book in Italy with the late Roloff Benny. On Simon's return to Vancouver, he photographed for and designed the book The Architecture of Arthur Erickson, for which he was awarded the American Institute of Graphic Arts Prize. He then formed his own practice of architectural photograph and presentation, and he retained Arthur Erickson as a long-term client, as well as working with many archi architectural and development offices. And Simon's work has been widely published. Simon met uh, Erickson in 1965, 1965 and was with him two days before he died. For several years, he's been the director of the Arthur Erickson Foundation. And I met Simon a couple of years ago in the garden of Arthur's house in West Vancouver where he provided a tour, uh, provided some unique insights into the life and career of this influential Canadian architect. So I thought this would be something that our architectural community here in London might appreciate finding out about. So I'm so glad that uh, Simon accepted our invitation to come and join us. So please welcome Simon Scott. Thank you. Now, the lights are going to go down a little bit. <clears throat> um, I do in encourage any of you who wish to move a little bit forward, if you feel like that, and become part of the group. Um, <clears throat> yes, I met this wonderful man, Arthur Erickson, in 65, and worked in conjunction with him, and uh, was a comrade and friend of his for a long time. Um, I'm going to spend a few minutes uh, about Arthur and his life and about his garden where uh, I met, met Richard. He, um, he spoke fluent Japanese and during the war he was in the, um, uh, the Far East, I'm not exactly sure where, but around Japan somewhere as an interpreter in the Canadian Army. And at that time, he was thinking of coming back to Canada and going into the diplomatic corps. But he saw um, a, a magazine photograph of Talliers and West and decided that that's the career he wanted to follow and went to Montreal, to McGill. He was offered a place at Frank, with Frank Lloyd Wright, but instead he gave that up to accept a traveling scholarship from McGill and spent time in North Africa, uh, the Adriatic, Mediterranean, uh, Europe, Scandinavia, Britain, for quite a, an extended period. And that set something in his person um, that carried on through his entire life. He never, ever was stationary for very long. He traveled constantly. And uh, I and many others believe that that was a huge contributor to his uh, understanding of how people live and how they can be um, housed either uh, privately or publicly in uh, the buildings that he created. This is Arthur as a, um, <clears throat> an elderly statesman. Uh, this was taken about a couple of years before he passed away. And Arthur Erickson, when he was really in the prime of his career, which was the sort of mid-80s, uh, he had finished Simon Fraser University, um, buildings like Robson Square and the Museum of Anthropology and UBC were underway. And this is Arthur, the relaxed person. When he was teaching at UBC, he found a, a, a piece of property, which is two 33-foot lots, with um, a garage and a shed right on the lane and a totally open um, uh, garden to the street. And he began by joining the garage and the shed together to make a little house for himself of 850 square feet. It had a living room, a, a, a dining room, 
which on one side had a single counter kitchen with doors that closed when you had finished cooking. Behind it was um, uh, a bathroom and a huge skylight that went right over the whole of those three rooms. Uh, I can remember sometimes sitting at his um, mirror top dining room table with this huge skylight above and just watching clouds drift by a plate. Beyond that, in what was the shed, he created a little personal studio for himself. Um, there's no bedroom, there's a sleeping loft behind, the, be, be, behind his little studio. Um, and it's often talked about as the um, 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 sanctuary for the creative spirit, which is very typical. And as you approach the property, which is, had a, has a fence around it now, it's not open to the, the rest of the street, you enter through this little door in the, in, the, um, in, the, in the fence to a garden that is monochromatic green, other than the time when the azaleas and uh, rhododendrons are, are out, and there are a lot of them. On the... <clears throat> far side of the property there is a fence which Arthur called the baffle fence. On the property line he was only allowed a four foot fence but on a 33 foot lot if you come three feet in there's not the same height restriction so he built another fence that um, uh, gave him the privacy but didn't restrict the width of the lot. There is water in every single project that he ever did and I mean every single project, private, public, institutional, all had reflective water. And the center of his garden, when he had finished uh, putting together the house and putting in planting and so on, he dredged the center of the, of the garden and built a mound, which you don't actually see here, to give some privacy from the street and, um, and, uh, and put all this planting around it. Wonderful. The, he, he tells a story of sitting out in the garden one day and he heard some ladies going by the fence on the outside and <laughs> he heard them say, this poor man, he bought this piece of property, he excavated for the house, it filled with water and now he has to live in the garage. <laughs> and the view from his studio looking out across one of two ponds very serene, very quiet, very secluded. Now this is an early photograph, it's not one of mine, uh, when uh, Arthur uh, first completed this. Um, Arthur was certainly a superstar, a world citizen, a jet setter, but he himself was a very kind, quiet, zen man. He lived very, very simply in this little um, oasis this little clearing in the forest. But he was a great partier. He partied a lot, whether it was in Vancouver or elsewhere. And one of the wonderful parties that is very memorable is when the Royal Ballet were performing in the Queen Elizabeth Theatre in Vancouver and Arthur Erickson held the after party. Uh, now, these names may not mean a lot to some of you, but they will to others. Uh, at that time, the Russian um, uh, Nureyev was the principal dancer and Margot Fontaine was his partner and they were world renowned and they were there in Arthur's garden for the party and on that occasion Arthur had brought in two black swans for the pond which I think you can see on that photograph. Now to <coughs> his career which began mainly with single family houses, which is not unlikely for many architects. Um, <clears throat> and he entered the competition in the early 60s for Simon Fraser University, a project which would eventually put him on the world map. And this is Arthur having just received the announcement that he had won the competition. And the model that you can see at the top of the screen is in fact the model of the, of the campus. Um, <coughs> Reflective water, always. Now, Simon Fraser has a long axis running north and south 
on the top of what's known as uh, Burnaby Mountain. It's, it's, it's a high hill, it's not a rocky mountain. Um, and the entrance is across the main axis, which reappears in many of his projects. And at the cross of those two axes is a wonderful skylight of uh, precast concrete and uh, glazed, which we'll see again later on. Some of you may have been to Simon Fraser University. When you enter, you come up into this mall. Um, uh, it's called the, um, I forgot the name right now. Um, and it has a wonderful, wonderful space frame, metal and, and wood ceiling, which is glazed, giving a, a wonderful central area. Uh, Arthur designed Simon Fraser University not as individual buildings, which many of the other competitors did, but as one continuous building, so that all students at some point are going to cross paths with, un with uh, others. And uh, it usually happens under this big roof. Reflective water, um, either still or moving. Again, uh, as you go through this mall, you'll come to steps which you see at the far end and these steps will bring you up to the academic quadrangle, which is the highest part of the campus. And from there, you can look north northerly to the, the mountains there that you can see, or if you look in the other direction, you look out into the flatlands uh, south of Vancouver to the estuary of the Simon Fraser River. And uh, here, students gather um, at all times of the year under this big roof and uh, in the distance is the estuary of the, of the um, Simon, Fraser University, uh, Simon Fraser River. Once you go into the quadrangle, um, <clears throat> the buildings are raised so that you can see out to the distant views as you're in that space. There is a very large, large uh, reflecting pool in there which gives the opportunity for these fantastic um, images. Uh, I'm very, very fond of one-point perspective. Um, <clears throat> and I use it a lot when it's available <laughs> in, uh, in my photography. I, I like the, uh, the fact that in one-point perspective it's the only time, either seeing or photographing, that the horizontal is horizontal. Looking in the other direction across this same pond, if you look behind the shrubs, at the, the high point of this um, shrubbery, you can see the, the edge of a little mound. Now the first time I ever went to Simon Fraser University, <coughs> uh, we drove, Arthur drove, from <coughs> the ocean, broad inlet, um, through Burnaby, up to the beginning of going up Burnaby Mountain. And he said, we're going to stop here. And we left the car, uh, got out of the car, walked through the woods. I don't know if some of you have been to Simon Fraser University. Uh, we walked through the woods, um, came out onto the grassland that surrounds the, the campus, and through the entrance, up the steps, up the steps, this is my first time, through that covered um, mall, up more steps, higher and higher, into the quadrangle, walked across stepping stones, which we don't see in this, that go through this uh, water, round the back of that mound, and there are some little steps that take you right up to the top of that, right up to the top of that mound. And Arthur said, now we've reached the summit. So it's this wonderful journey from the ocean to the summit. More reflective water more horizontals. Up to now, all the photographs that you've seen have included sky. So the buildings are buildings within a space. This photograph, I eliminated the sky because I wanted the photograph to be a space within a building. And that, I think, uh, works when you can have a building like that and eliminate the, uh, the sky. Now the first, that dome that I said it would, it would, is the crossroads of the two axes um, is just there. 
can see it. On the northern side of the campus is what we called in the office the classroom block. Uh, full, full of, well, on one side of the academic quadrangle is the, um, uh, the classics sort of side and on the other side is the sciences. And here are classrooms. Uh, the roofs are all flooded to bring light into the, into the ground. And I think this is a wonderful, typical of Arthur, melding of a building into its surroundings. There are many people who, who say he was just as much an, uh, a landscape architect as he was an architect. He said that any site, he wasn't saying that every site should be built on, but he said that every site should be more beautiful, not less, with the building. Now to Southern Alberta and Lethbridge University. Um, this was in 19, finished in 1972, and uh, between the cliffs that you can see there and the trees runs the Old Man River. And the city of Vancouver is behind the camera, behind you at the moment, um, and the university is on the other side of the river. Uh, these little undulating um, uh, landscape uh, are called coolies, and the, the building stands rather like a ship that's coming through the, the undulation. And the, 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 the master plan is that there be two of these with a, with a connection between, so that um, this, um, this is the finished edge, edge of this building, and it was going to go further over, and then another one behind it so that there were, there were two of them with a, with a connection. Sadly, as in many cases, um, board of directors change, uh, owners change, and, and um, uh, the uh, wonderful master plans are not necessarily um, continued, which has sadly happened at Simon Fraser, and it sadly happened here. Unfortunately, um, there are now build other buildings behind the one that you can see, and, and uh, there are they're all sticking up behind this, and it, it's very unfortunate and a little untidy. And there is the uh, the Old Man River. The underneath this plaza are all the um, uh, mechanics, and um, uh, that would supply would have supplied both buildings. Um, some people, you know, everybody asks, "What's your favorite car, or your favorite child, or your favorite building?" And I've often been asked, what's my favorite photograph? This happens to be it. Um, it did appear on a, a Canadian postage stamp at one time. Um, it's my, f if I had to choose, it is my favorite photograph for two reasons. One is uh, the memory of being there. Um, the parking lot is on the other side of the building. And at two o'clock in the morning, I, I traipsed around over these hills and came up through here because I didn't want to arrive and, and trample all the, all the grass here. And I also wanted to approach a building that I was going to photograph, not walk away from it. You know, if, you, if you're going to meet someone, you greet them, you go towards them, you don't walk away from them and then turn back. Um, but the other reason that I, I like this photograph is because for me, it is very, very much Arthur. Um, as I mentioned, Arthur was a, uh, a quiet, um, kind, not over gregarious person, but he was powerful. He was very powerful in a, in a very quiet way. No residential client ever realized what they were going to end up living in. Never. Um, and the same was, were, was with commercial um, uh, clients and so on as well. Um, have some of you been to Robson Square in Vancouver? I hope you have or I hope you will. Um, it's a provincial government building in the center of Van Vancouver and um, it is a uh, provincial government building. And the provincial government wanted Arthur to, des to design a 50-story building 
this is going to represent British Columbia, a 50-story building. And Arthur simply said, if this is for British Columbia, it has to be for the people of British Columbia. And he took the square footage of that 50-story tower, turned it horizontal, depressed it into the land, three stories, filled with, with skylights, and it comes three stories up. Covered with parks, uh, uh, playing areas, people sitting on steps, waterfalls, ponds, and so on. It is a place in the center of the city where people go. So the provincial government got all of their office space, but British Columbia and their visitors got a place to be. And that's what Arthur wanted it to be. Um, that's going off subject a little bit because we've still got um, a bit of Lethbridge University. <laughs> um, <clears throat> This powerful, powerful horizontal building and its interior. One point perspective again. <clears throat> I'm very fond of one point perspective and I think it is very relaxing. And I have come to believe in watching buildings and photographing them that there is something very magical about water. Water is horizontal. And I believe that contributes to the value of either owning or living or, or, or walking by the water. That horizontal is calming to our nature. It's not like uh, Niagara Falls. Niagara Falls is exciting and to photograph a building uh, in a dramatic way is great, but I love one-point perspective. Now at the university, when you enter the, into the main entrance, there is a, uh, by car, there is a roundabout that you go round and come back out again. And in the middle of that roundabout, there is a mound. And Arthur said to me, um, I had done some um, public sculpture. Um, I want you to uh, create something for the entrance of Lethbridge University. And so I did it in concrete, which is his uh, loved material. This is 18 feet high and about 24, in, 24 feet long. Um, I took a square, it, the concrete is two feet wide, um, cut a hole in it, uh, separated, this is in the design process, separated them uh, horizontally and vertically and uh, they became steps, and there's a memorial on a, on a, on a, a step on the far side. Um, it was where Premier Lohi had opened the university, and the reason I did this was partly related to my, um, my photography uh, uh, career. When you drive around the roundabout, these two halves, will close and they will open as an aperture and it's called aperture and it's the symbol for the university. And so I wanted to create this aperture as the entrance of the light of learning into the university. And there it is, it, it is at night. Now to the Museum of Anthropology, which is certainly one of his uh, finest buildings, um, built to house the, uh, the artwork of the West Coast native people. And Arthur claimed quite correctly that their artwork was directly from their living, their sustenance, and their relationship with the animals of the forest, the sea, and the ocean. And so when you enter the university and you come through some trees, so you're in the forest, uh, purchase your ticket, you go down a long, long gradual ramp and at that point the artifacts are on both sides of you lit from skylight so you're still in the forest but you get to the bottom of the ramp and the whole of the building opens up as it would anywhere you walk through a forest and come to a shoreline. It's, it's a very defining point between the density of the, of the forest and the openness of the sea.
the, um, the area here that you see just in front, um, at that point, was still gravel. And uh, Arthur wanted this to be water, A, because he wants water in everything, and B, because of the story I've just told you, and C, so that it would collect to the, um, the ocean. So it, it, it had the effect of being in a little backwater in the, in the Pacific coast. And here the interior. Now, um, it, the pond was filled with water for an apex conference in Vancouver, but immediately drained the next day. <laughs> it was filled with water for uh, Arthur's 80th birthday. Some of us in the office said, you know, you're getting close to 80, uh, what would you like for your 80th birthday? Thinking he would say a, a Canadian embassy in some fantastic location. He simply said, water in the pond at the museum. It was filled for his 80th birthday, and the party was held here. Um, it was drained the next day. However, uh, in the last, I would say, three years or so, sadly after his, he had died, uh, it is there permanently now. And um, so it is part of his concept and part of the experience of being there. Um, uh, most of the time I, I like brilliant sunshine and I, I like deep shadows and blue skies and so on. Um, however, I went out this day, um, which is very west coast, the sort of uh, atmosphere that the native people would have uh, spent a lot of their time in. And I love the fact that the, um, the majesty of the, um, the, the native poles here in this um, did, outdoor display is reflected in Arthur's um, uh, concrete poles. A building we call the Mill and Bloedel building in <coughs> Vancouver because the client was uh, the Mill, uh, Mill and Bloedel uh, Lumber Company and they asked Arthur to build their uh, headquarters in British Columbia, in, in Vancouver. <coughs> It's, I believe, the most honest building in Vancouver. It is concrete. Um, whether, whether you're architectural or not, um, and usually if you're not, uh, it's sad that so many people think that concrete is just for the foundations, because it is magnificent. And Arthur produced it magnificently here. Now this is a Sikh temple, um, <clears throat> and um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with uh, a building that Arthur did in Montreal <clears throat> for Expo 67, which was man and his community. It was a, a timber building on a, uh, an oct octagon, oct whatever eight sides is, um, and each time the, the frame moved and moved and moved and moved and moved and it got narrow and narrow and narrow as it went up. It was a very spectacular building. Um, and this is rather similar, but it's not eight sides, it's, it's four sides, but each time uh, the roof steps up uh, and it has these, uh, these um, skylights in it, it, it turns uh, 45 degrees. And the uh, the stainless steel um, uh, cupola on the top, so so incredibly simple, but so so incredibly effective, and I think that's that says a lot about the, uh, Arthur's attitude and and the results he got. Uh, he wasn't a complex person, uh, and he wasn't a complex designer, uh, but he attained a wonderful, magnificent simplicity. This is a very small building in Victoria, actually. It's the headquarters of a lumber company. And so it, 
it displays lumber <clears throat> and um, these simple nine columns uh, which spread out into trees and support the roof. Um, the interior of Arthur's uh, office when uh, he and Jeff Massey actually built their own office had the same structure. And so within the, his office at that time, um, there were three small offices on a, on a slightly higher level and everybody else, everybody else was in a, an area the size of this auditorium uh, underneath these trees with the desks all s nestled around them. And here's the lumber, the, the lumber company in the, in the lumber yard. Very, very simple. Now this is south of the border. Uh, it's in Tacoma, which is between Vancouver and Seattle. Um, <clears throat> and Tacoma is the birthplace of Shahuli. Uh, the glass artist, world-renowned. And this is not a museum of his art, but it is a museum of glass art. Uh, some of his is there, but uh, there's glass art from all over the world. Um, reflective water, this time it's on the roof, and uh, glass sculptures are um, displayed there for you know periods of three months and so on. At the end is this big cone, which is covered in stainless steel, um, <clears throat> and it is a theatre. It's a theatre in the round, uh, but the roof is, uh, is tilted slightly to give it a, an effect, and uh, the theatre is a s circular stage with seating all the way round, about five tiers of seating in bright red, uh, and on the stage are the glass blowers. Rather than glass blowers being in a, in a back room somewhere, they're right there where the visitors can go and sit around and watch them and some of them have a mic so that they can relate to the audience what they're doing. <clears throat> now from glass art to glass roof, this is the uh, <clears throat> the new courthouse in, in Vancouver. When I say new, it's you know 20 odd years old now. Um, <clears throat> and I know that we just walked in past your, your courthouse here. Um, this is a beautiful piece of geometry. With a glass roof. But Arthur never started to create geometry or could create, uh, obviously wanted it to be a brilliant piece of ar architecture, he, he began by trying to understand, as he did in the museum, uh, the reason for the building. And Arthur felt that most people who are in court are in a big stone or concrete building because they presume to don't have done something wrong and they're very contained. And if you come out of a courtroom, typically, you come into a corridor. You're still contained. Your adversary is 15 feet away. And you haven't left that tension. If it's a, a break in proceedings or a coffee break or something, if you're still in there, you're still uh, uh, in the courtroom uh, atmosphere. But every single courtroom in this building opens out onto balconies, cascading planting down the balconies, under a, a glass roof where you see the sky. Is it raining or is it cloudy? Is it the sun shining? You see the buses, you see the people, and your whole demeanor, your whole attitude has been relieved of the tension that has been behind you. Uh, you know, in many cases it's going to start again when you go back in. But Arthur wanted not just to design a brilliant building, but design a building where uh, he, he hoped to uh, benefit the people who were going to be in it. Now we've seen some pretty major buildings. Um, here's a lovely little building uh, on one of the, the streets leading out of Vancouver. Um, this is a hairdressing salon. Um, someone who was very, very successful in this trade 
came to Arthur and, and wanted something special. Um, and uh, the interior, understandably, looks um, not as illuminated as this during the daytime, you know, glass doesn't let you look in very much during the daytime, but as soon as the, as the light level goes down, um, the interior becomes evident. Very clever little building. Only, um, I think, 33 feet wide. And then in other parts of the world, I, I, I mean, there are many projects he did all over the world. This is in um, Cambridge University in England, and it's a research lab for a pharmaceutical organization. It's not a teaching building, it's um, a technical research building, but uh, related to uh, a major university. Again, wonderful simplicity. The entire build, building is just these um, uh, precast concrete forms, open at each end, and the, the opening we can see there with a bridge going across, the reflective water is the entrance. Exhibition buildings. He did many of them, including Expo uh, 67 in Montreal, which I just mentioned. Um, this is Expo 70 in Osaka in Japan. Arthur loved Japan um, and he, uh, as I say, he spoke Japanese. He spent a lot of time in Japan, either professionally or, 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 or traveling. And he was asked to do the Canadian Pavilion in, in Expo 70, which actually won the highest award of, uh, of, the, of the fair. It is a square with a, a, a square opening in the center. Um, these squares are uh, triangles with glass on the outside and glass where they, where they come into the entrances. There are an entrance on all four corners. So glass um, sloping down on all sides. Um, inside there are um, seating areas, exhibition areas, and so on. In the center, there is uh, water, reflective water, um, which also can be ice for, for ice skating. And there are five mirrored columns. There are five of these mirrored columns. And on the top, they had what we call spinners. Um, they are artwork of the very, very famous Canadian, uh, sorry, British Columbian artist, Gordon Smith. You may or may not know that, that name. Um, Gordon is an, an amazing man and they were great friends and Gordon designed these spinners which um, are circular. They have chrome along the outside. This is a canvas um, uh, painted with these circles which break every now and again. And all of these columns, which are three-sided, moved constantly and slowly. So the reflections, the reflections on these columns are, were continually changing. Sometimes they were reflecting the interior, sometimes they were reflecting each other, and these spinners were continuously turning. Very clever. Now we'll go to residential buildings. This, <clears throat> for most people, was a very challenging site. Um, you can see the cliff up here, which drops down to a ledge, and then drops down to a ledge, drops down to a ledge, drops down right down to the ocean. And uh, nobody had wanted it, because it was impossible to build on, um, but Arthur did. Beautiful structure, wood and glass. This was finished in um, uh, 1973. The first owners, a young couple, sadly divorced, and the the um, 
house changed hands. Um, <clears throat> I have really come to realize from visiting many of these houses, and this is not, not just related to Arthur, um, <clears throat> is that a really, really good piece of architecture, particularly a house, is not just the result of a good architect, it's also the result of a good client. And I think it's, it's, it's that, it's the genius obviously of the, of the architect, but it's the relationship between the, the two that really brings out the best. So sadly this lost their original um, client. It went through a second and then a third and then a, eventually a fourth owner and changes were made, uh, <clears throat> there was some neglect and the fourth owner bulldozed it. You know, I sometimes speak at um, <clears throat> city halls or municipal halls when, <clears throat> um, uh, when there are buildings, particularly houses that um <clears throat> might be in danger. Um, and I say, you know, things like this, they're not just a house. They are, they are part of our Canadian built culture and that's the attitude that we should take when dealing with them. Anyway, this is gone. And this is the house of Gordon Smith, the man who, who designed the, <coughs> the spinners. <coughs> Gordon is now 98 and he's still painting. Um, <coughs> he is extremely well known on the on the west coast and I'm sure there are major collectors across the country as well. Um, <clears throat> he paints from a, from a wheelchair. <clears throat> One of his commissions um, about three or four years ago uh, Canada House in uh, Trafalgar Square uh, was to be restored and renovated and they the Canadian Embassy moved out for the restoration and when they moved back in Gordon was commissioned to do a painting and I think it's about it's about 15 feet by 10 feet uh, and it's in the rotunda of Canada House um, <clears throat> and there's a wonderful photograph which I don't actually have but I've seen of um, <coughs> Gordon Smith in his wheelchair is taken from the back and the Queen ready to, to uh, talk to him, not unveil it, but uh, to talk to him about, about this piece. And I thought, how wonderful, you know, here's a man who's still painting at 98 and, uh, and he gets this wonderful commission from the Canadian government and uh, the, the Queen comes to, to see it. The house is um, a square with uh, an opening in the middle. And <clears throat> if you drive in from the driveway, there's an open carport. Incidentally, Arthur never ever built a garage. Every single one of his houses only have carports. So you come into the carport, um, up a few steps into a, 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 another side of the square, which has the, the kitchen and dining room, up another side, which is the living room, which is the piece that you can see right here and then up a few more steps into this side, which is the sleeping and, bar and um, uh, bedroom area, and then up another few steps, and you're on the roof of the carport. So it just steps up all the way around. And there is part of the, uh, <clears throat> part of the courtyard, the living room, which is the only piece that spans. It spans from a, a rock outcrop here to another rock outcrop outcrop. The other pieces are actually on the land and this, this wonderful courtyard in the middle. Something else that Arthur felt um, in most of what he did um, and very much in, in timber but, but in concrete as well, um, if, if a span requires a 4 inch by 16 inch beam most of you who are here as architects know that you only need a 4x4 four four post.
but Arthur felt that to have this huge beam sitting on this little post was visually uncomfortable. That pressure that, that you, you absorb visually about the heavy beam of 16 inches on just 4x4. Four four. So he always made the, the column the same proportion as the beam to relieve that visual tension. And he did it in um, uh, concrete as well. Now we've seen two, um, this house of course still exists, we've still seen two um, wood and glass houses, both done in the 1960s. And now we go to concrete and glass done in the 1970s. Um, this is the first house for two twin brothers. I'm sure there are many people, uh, oh sorry, many architects who have done work for people in the same family, but to do, do two houses for two twin brothers I think is pretty special. Um, this was a, an unused piece of property because it, it had a, a steep slope um, and was, had become a bit of a garbage dump. Um, uh, Arthur uh, did this concrete house. You enter the top into a, a carport and then the next level down is actually the children's bedrooms which are up here and then this level is the main living level and this level is the master bedroom and, uh, and uh, Hugo's office. Uh, it's surrounded by, by some pieces of sculpture in, a, again, a reflecting pond. The sculpture was done by uh, the client's uh, brother in, in Germany. They, they were both from either, either Germany or Austria, the two twin brothers who are out here. Um, here it is a little more, more mature. The um, planting is beginning to grow in. This frame repeats in exactly the same dimensions, horizontally, vertically, and, and moving back. So in all three d dimensions, either stepping back or stepping up or stepping horizontally, it's always this same dimension. It doesn't alter. And within that, either if it's in the interior, it's a solid wall, uh, it's glazing, which you can see just there. Uh, it's a screen or it's totally open. Again, my, my love of one point perspective, when the lines, the horizontal lines are horizontal. It's the only time you ever uh, see that. There was a creek, or th there is, or I should say, a creek running on the far side of the property, and some of it was funneled into this, um, create this p pond and the, uh, and the little mound. Other pieces of, of stainless steel sculpture there. And this is looking across the lake into the master bedroom. And out from the master bedroom, very, very elegant, beautifully elegant. And you can see some more stainless steel sculpture in the pond there. And the bathroom with a sunken tub. And I waited until the, uh, the light coming through the, the slit window there with the bamboo on the outside just struck the, struck the wall there. Um, <clears throat> in this house, um, uh, Arthur also designed this um, chandelier, which is lighting and planting. Um, an interesting story here, um, Arthur didn't want a um, handrail and uh, during construction when the project architect came back to the office he said Arthur uh, they want a handrail the, the building inspector wants a handrail and Arthur said no 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 handrail and so Nick Nick went back to the next weekly inspection and got the same thing you know there must be a handrail and 
He said, well, Arthur doesn't want a handrail. No, there must be a handrail. This went on for the last two or three months of the completion of the house with what looked like no resolve. And uh, eventually, Arthur, I, 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 whether he took the client out to dinner or because obviously they weren't here, they were living in that previous house, or he met them or went to see them, and he said, move in. And they moved in. And there's never been a handrail. <laughs> This beautiful wooden screen of yellow cedar uh, was partly as a as a handrail because there's an, there's another stair that goes down down under 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 here, and the screen is actually just there. So the um, the carport is up there, the children's bedrooms, the basic living area, which is the uh, the living room, there's the stair with no handrail. Uh, the kitchen is, this is family room, the kitchen is behind it, out onto the decks and the swimming pool, just there. And then um, Helmut's uh, office and the master bedroom. Looking out <coughs> from the main level, uh, this sculpture here, and there's some more sculpture at the bottom, just there. I can tell you that taking one of these pictures, I can't remember which, I was there in this lovely sunlight beside the water. Uh, on previous occasions, um, <clears throat> ducks had flown into the pond. There were the remains of some Douglas firs, the rushes in the water, the ferns, the wonderful foliage. And I was, I, I, all of this work is, is with a four by five camera, if you know what that is, Sheet, sheets of film and a big hood over your head. And um, I was there, I couldn't focus. My, <laughs> my eyes were just run, running with tears. I was surrounded by this wonderful, wonderful foliage, etc., And I was focusing on concrete and steel. And it, it made me think, and I really believe this, that I'm not saying in necessarily only in the architectural world at all, but we talk about the natural world and the man-made world as if they're miles apart. They are not miles apart. They become one. Whatever we do becomes part of the natural world. The important thing is how well we do it. That was quoted in, in incidentally in a Canadian art, architect magazine when, the, when they did an article on my photography. Now this uh, so the, the concrete house was 1970s, this is now 1980s, and this is a steel and glass house, which is the, um, the second house of the two twin brothers. Um, <clears throat> uh, again, reflecting water, uh, they, these two brothers started a steel um, uh, manufacturing plant that become became highly, highly successful. Uh, they manufactured steel for the lumber industry, the logging industry. They built tunnel bores for uh, the, the mountains. They did the test bore for the British Channel. Uh, and they built things right down to computer components. Very, very successful. And wonderful men, both of them. Uh, and they were really, really uh, patrons of the art. They loved Arthur, they loved his work, and eventually they each had a house. They actually manufactured the steel 
for this house uh, and they erected it. These curves have um, uh, clear glass looking out in this direction, but in the curve it's all glass block. You can see there the glass block in the reflection. There you can particularly see the glass block. Um, <clears throat> the master bedroom suite is up here. The main living space is here. Um, but as you saw uh, in the here, it's actually an L-shaped building. The, all the inhabited portion is here. And this is actually a swimming pool under here. And the, the, uh, the steel comes in a different, in a different direction. Uh, they did all the chrome work, and then Hugo invited Arthur to design all of the interiors. And Arthur designed every single piece of furniture, um, tables, chairs, um, uh, <coughs> planters, furniture in the living room, right down to the um, <coughs> candlesticks, um, uh, lighting fixtures, uh, serviette rings, uh, placemats. Arthur designed everything and they built everything. Now, a building quite near to you, this, in, this is in Cambridge, um, uh, for a, a client here, and uh, it still is very much Arthur's vernacularly. Um, hor strong horizontals, uh, different layers. Um, in this case, everything is covered in brick, uh, you know, relating more to this, this part of Canada. I'm not sure which river runs through uh, Cambridge, but... Uh, Thank you. Now th this furniture was chosen by Arthur, but not, it, it wasn't designed by Arthur. But the, the previous, the steel house was, was all, all uh, designed by Arthur and built by the client. Now to um, a, a house which is a very different character altogether. Uh, most of Arthur's um, uh, work is very horizontal, very horizontal. Simon Fraser, is layers and layers and layers, and Robson Square steps down. Um, that's uh, typical of his vernacular and, um, and many of his houses. This is up on a cliff, um, which dropped off very, very rapidly. And so Arthur created a volume. It's all covered in cedar, the, the, wa the exterior walls and the roof. So there's a, a membrane and then a space and then a, a cedar covering. And out of that um, volume, he cut balconies and um, windows to create this. Very beautiful, very, very um, stunning, but quite a bit of a departure from um, what he had been doing for other clients. looking out to the ocean, and if you know Vancouver at all, uh, Bowen Island, uh, which is now becoming very inhabited, is across House Sound, and that's Bowen Island over there. So the, the ferries that go by here are going from Vancouver over to Vancouver Island. Now the last project. Um, this actually is one of the very first houses that Arthur ever did. It was when he had returned from his uh, period in the, uh, of his traveling scholarship uh, and the Adriatic. And um, a young man who was uh, the son 
of a highly, highly successful lumber man in, on Vancouver Island. Uh, his father was Swedish, and he opened a, um, or started a lumber company which became the largest employer on Vancouver Island just after the turn of the century. Um, and his son, um, with his father's help or, or gift, I don't know, bought a piece of property and asked Arthur to design him a house. He wanted a house um, to be not just a house, but a center of learning where he could invite musicians and um, uh, philosophers and, and uh, writers uh, to come there. It's not a very big house. Uh, it was designed in 1959, and in 1961, it was published as the most fabulous house in Canada. Now, 1961, Vancouver was a backwards, let alone a place on Vancouver Island, where this is. But there it was on the cover of a, of a Toronto published magazine. It had one, uh, a site that Arthur claims is the finest site he's ever built on. Um, this is a, a corner, a column at a corner of the, of the house. Arthur actually sculpted the, the site uh, before um, creating the house. This is looking down to Denman and Hornby Island, if you know that area. It's uh, on the way out to Campbell River. Um, it's a long uh, house, only uh, one major and one very minor um, uh, bedroom. And I mentioned Arthur's garden, um, I think. Well, I mentioned at Simon Fraser that um, it, it has an east-west axis and then a north-south axis, and the, this pivotal point in the middle. <clears throat> uh, and you enter across the major axis. The same thing is true when you enter into Arthur's little private garden. You come in the side of the property through the forest, and then there's an opening when you, when you get into the middle of the garden. And this house has a similar plan, and I maintain that the plan of this house is very similar to the plan of Simon Fraser University, if you have a chance to look at the two of them. From the bedroom, you can go out onto a balcony that looks right down on the beach and, and to the mountains and uh, ocean of Vancouver Island. And on the other side, it looks back into the forest uh, and <laughs> this amazing oak tree which was on the property when, when it was purchased. And the house that Arthur, Arthur designed was this. It is really a glass case. Uh, there appear to be very few walls. Um, most of it, or all of it in fact, is supported on these steel columns. Uh, this is a, a yellow cedar um, tube and there's lighting that goes up and lighting that goes down. Um, it's not that easy to see on this one, but there are wooden screens in here and wooden screens in here, which you'll see in a few minutes. In fact, um, yeah, these yellow, uh, yellow cedar screens, uh, where is this thing, um, are between all of, the, uh, of these um, lighting tubes. And you can see how trans transparent it is. The most fabulous house in Canada. Sadly, this is what happened to it. The original owner for whom it was designed died before it was finished. The second owner was an American, an elderly American and his younger wife, and they lived in it, and they, they didn't do it any damage. They, uh, um, they didn't furnish it very well, but they, uh, they enjoyed it, and uh, I was there many times. What we have seen um, here is the side that's facing the ocean. But if you go to the other side, this is where you enter. Uh, the driveway is 
is beyond here. Uh, this glass is held back from the columns and these, um, these lovely screens. This is what happened to it. Absolutely atrocious. I had been there many times. I never knew the original owner who died, but I did know the, the elderly, elderly American and his young wife, and um, <clears throat> visited there often. And uh, <clears throat> uh, one of my hobbies is old cars, and another one is motorbikes. And I was riding my motorbike up there, and I thought, oh, I'll go and, go and see the Philbrook house. And this is what I found. I couldn't believe it. This is a shot from the interior where you can also see that the, the glazing is, is um, back from these columns, leaving this space between the, the, um, the beautiful screens and the, the glazing. This is what happened to it. I mean, can you believe it? Why would, any, why would anybody buy a house that you've first seen if this is what they wanted. And, I mean, this has a magnificent view right out over Comox Harbor to the mountains and the uh, Comox Glacier. You can see there the original line of the glazing. I, I will never understand, ever. Uh, there's a... There's a marble plinth just here, and there was a brass um, fire tray on it, and then a big hood that went up out of this, um, the opening there, which they put a skylight on. This wonderful view out from the interior of the house out to the, the islands. The American died, and a third owner purchased it. And <clears throat> he sold it. Uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, after the second owner, who did this hideous mess, um, sold it. And I wasn't aware that it had been sold from him. And again, I was on my motorbike. And I thought, I'll just go and see if that really was as bad as I thought it was. And I got there, and it was covered in blue tarpaulins, blowing in the wind. And I thought, what the hell's going on now? And there were a couple of guys digging a ditch, and I said, what, can you tell me what's happening here? And he said, well, you'll have to go and talk to Doug. So I went to the back, and here was a guy in a t-shirt and jeans and a baseball cap on backwards. And uh, I tried to talk to him, but he didn't want to have anything to do with me. But I persisted. I told him I knew Arthur. I had photographed the, the building, that um, uh, I had photographed it and published it, uh, and that uh, you know I was fascinated by what was happening. And he was beginning to pull it apart. This is what was the open uh, seating area, looking out right out to the, to the view of the mountains. And this is where he's starting to pull it apart. And um, I came back to Vancouver, and I got all the photographs I could. I got copies of all the original drawings, magazines, etc. cetera. Um, Doug uh, is, has done very, very well in his business which is designing and, uh, or inventing and manufacturing salmon lures. And he's made a lot of money doing it, but he's still a very hands-on guy. Um, his hobby is restoring old cars. He lived right next door to this house, so he, he, he built his house after the what's called Philburg House was was built, and he uh, knew the second owner, 
and then he saw what happened to it. And when it came up for sale from the guy who did all the crap to it, Doug bought it. He had the, he had the means to purchase it. So he purchased a piece of property right beside him. He started pulling it apart. And as I got to know him, uh, he said, you know, I thought if I, can, if I can restore an old car, maybe I can restore an old house. And I went up to see him every six weeks or so for about nine months because he had no architectural background. Uh, he hadn't been in touch with Arthur. And so I became, I guess, a bit of a link. And from that, which was the original, uh, a photograph of the original house, to it, whoops, to it being pulled apart, and that's what it is today. Why would you want to block that in? This is the house. It now has double glazing, it has a heat exchange. Um, uh, Doug didn't disturb the ceiling at all. He opened up the roof uh, from above and insulated. This is now the living room again. The, um, <clears throat> he apparently, at least he tells a story, that he was um, having some coffee with some of his buddies in town, because this is a little bit out of Comox. Uh, and they said, uh, so what car are you restoring this winter, Doug? And he said, uh, well, I'm, I'm working on that Felberg house. And they said, oh, well, you should speak to Jimmy up the road. He's got some bits of metal from that house. <laughs> and so he went up to see this Jimmy, who was a scrap metal dealer, <clears throat> and he had the brass from this fireplace all cut up with a, a acetylene torch in a heap. <clears throat> and Doug bought it from him, made a pattern from the bits, and then had the, 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 the fire hood rebuilt. Um, this was in the 19, late 1980s, I think. Yeah. And when it was complete, I, um, I mean, these, these are new photographs, this one. I went up and lived there for about four days and I photographed it extensively um, in its now restored condition. I mean, it, it's, it's a piece of art. Absolutely magnificent. There it is with the, uh, with the lighting on. This is looking back towards the building from the balcony of the, that's, this is the master bedroom. And the end of this balcony is where that photograph was taken from right down onto the beach. So it's a very, very steep cliff. Um, this is the open area which was all blocked in with this stucco, all opened up again. And uh, I mean, he did a, a, an amazing job. The house, uh, I mean, it's horrible to think this, uh, what somebody did to it, but it's actually in much better condition now than it is if it had just stood. Uh, the, the restoration really did a lot for it. When I had photographed it for these three or four days, um, I, uh, at the invitation of the AIBC, who have a little um, <clears throat> display area at their offices, I put together a, an exhibition of this house uh, showing some original photographs back in the 70s um, and then the crap that happened um, and then 30 30 by 30 uh, images of the house today, um, most of which you have seen. And uh, it was, Arthur was still alive, so uh, he came to the opening. It was the biggest event that the AIBC has, had held. Um, 
and uh, I called the exhibition the most fabulous house in Canada <laughs> from its original um, publication. And the AIBC nominated Doug and I for a Lieutenant Go Governor's Award, which we won for the restoration of the house. So I said to Arthur, who hadn't met Doug at this time, Doug is very shy. He, he didn't even come to Vancouver for the exhibition or the, or the Lieutenant Governor's Award. But I said to Arthur, you have to come back. You have to come back, back up to Comox and see the house again and meet Doug. And so this was the last photograph that I actually took of Arthur at this house, which um, was right at the very, very, very beginning of his, of his career. And, and absolutely brilliant. I mean, today it's such a, a brilliant piece of design. You know, it, it's, it's dated because of its period, but it's detailing and it's brilliance and it's sense of space and, uh, and uh, just the thrill of being there is incredible. Thank you. I'm more than happy to answer any questions if I know what, if I actually know what the answer is, and I encourage you. I encourage, yes. I'm just curious, for someone of his generation to be speaking Japanese, I just wondered how that came about. Was he born in Japan, or? He was not born in Japan, and it's a question that I can't actually answer. I don't know why he decided to study Japanese. Um, his mother was a very um, uh, a very involved lady in culture in Vancouver, in art and music and so on. And um, she knew this lady, Mrs. I can't remember her name now, who uh, gave uh, lessons in, in Japanese. Uh, but what actually promoted Arthur to want to learn it, I, I can't answer the question, but I know that's how he learned it. Don't be shy. Yes. Simon, with Arthur traveling so much, can you talk a little bit about like his working method and, and you know how did he maintain control over the work, uh, all these huge projects that he was doing while traveling so much? Well, it's uh, it's a very very um, <coughs> legitimate question. Um, <coughs> Arthur did most of his actual designing in that little studio, in that, in that little tiny, tiny house of his, um, or on an, on an airplane. Because uh, particularly when Robson Square, the courthouse, the museum, and so on were on, the, the, the staff were over 100. So as soon as they came into the office, there were meetings, there were uh, consultations with, with uh, structural people and other um, uh, consultants. Uh, letters to write, um, reports to do, um, speeches to write because he, he spoke all over the world. Um, <clears throat> but there was a huge enthusiasm of um, spending time with the master. That's basically what it was. And so um, everybody crowded around when um, he came and talked about whatever project it was. There were lots of drawings. There were always lots of models, and um, and he uh, uh, he had a wonderful nature. It was very calm, but it was very deliberate. And so <clears throat> that's how we worked with him. And uh, and then he would be off, and we'd get um, at that time we'd get um, uh, faxes coming in with you know sketches for uh, for you know. What, how this should be changed and how that should be changed. Um, I don't think that Arthur probably ever used a T-square or a, or a, or a, a rule. Um, <clears throat> uh, just to diverse a slight bit, um, we had someone doing some graphics for the now Arthur Erickson Foundation. And uh, 
one of, there were two schemes that the graphic designer came up with. One was a, um, um, what do you call it, protractor, you know, a compass, compass yes. Um, because, he, you know, th this designer thought, you know, this is an A for Arthur, and, and it's something that architects use. And I said, Arthur wouldn't know how to use one of those. Everything was just so fluid. Um, I was speaking a couple of uh, weeks ago, and I was saying that it's quite amazing that this architecture, which is so deliberate, uh, so geometric, so even in its um, patterns, came from someone who just did this loose, loose sketching all the time. Very, very loose. It, it was, there was a lot of it, but it was very loose. But it, it brought this. And, and every time Arthur came back into the office, you know, he just took the whole thing a little bit, uh, a little bit further. And I'd like to tell you a story relating to your question. Um, we were working on the Museum of Anthropology, <clears throat> and Arthur had been traveling a lot. And um, <clears throat> coming back every two weeks or one week or three weeks or whatever it was, and he was always back for a couple of days. And there was a, a presentation to take place on a Wednesday at UBC. We had had no, a numerous meetings with the faculty of uh, anthropology and the, and the people who were directly involved, but this was a meeting with the board or whatever of, of, of UBC for the museum. <clears throat> and so we had the model built, the drawings finished, the photographs done, printed, um, uh, uh, at that time, a slide presentation, all ready, so that we could walk through it, and Arthur would have all the information he needed. But Arthur came in, and we were sitting around this uh, this table with model and so on. He said, "You know, um, I think that should that, that should move. That should be wider, and this needs to move back." And, and, and he spoke like this, very gently, but with great determination. And so we spent an hour and a half with him, and the whole bloody thing changed. And I must say, uh, I, I, I always had huge admiration for him, but I thought, bloody hell, Arthur. You know, we've been working on this for three weeks. We've got it absolutely ready for it, and you're pulling it all apart. And having Arthur, having said all that, looked at his watch and lifted his jacket and said, oh, I've got to go and meet so-and-so so for dinner tonight. Gone. We had to pull the model apart, um, redo all the drawings. We had to contact the, um, the blueprint people to ask them to come in at 5 o'clock in the morning to print all the drawings again. Um, I had to photograph it. Um, uh, process the film, do more um, uh, uh, prints. Um, uh, that's after we're rebuilding the model. Um, and uh, they were all black and white prints, so I could do them in my darkroom. Uh, but I had to phone the color lab and get them to come in at five in the morning and process slides. Um, and it, it took the whole night to do it. And by about being really pissed off at five or six o'clock, by about two or three in the morning, I thought, fantastic, this is brilliant. And it was. And uh, he had that way of just moving everything forward. Uh, his mother said that uh, the only way that Arthur will stop designing is when you build it. <laughs> So he, he was highly admired, um, and it was, it was a thrill to be there as he progressed these designs. Now, on that particular time, it was, it was ridiculously um, crucial as far as timing is concerned. But it's a, it's a story I always remember. Yes? So um, you showed us the photos of the house that was... Um desecrated and then put back together again. Mm -hmm. Are many of the uh, houses that he did that are out on the West Coast uh, designated now or protected in any way from 
that sort of uh, fact? <laughs> I have to tell you that none of them are, sadly, very, very sadly. I have spoken at um, Vancouver City Hall, at uh, Burnaby City Hall, at West Vancouver City Hall, and I have said, <clears throat> we can't possibly um, go to somebody who has just, you know, we, we sit back and think, oh, well, you know, Jim so-and-so, he's okay in his house, and Gordon Smith's okay in his house, and so on. But when they come up for sale, we can't then go to the new owner who's just spent multi-million dollars and say, by the way, you can't do this, you can't do this, you can't do this. The municipalities or the, or the, or the city have to draw up a, um, a list of what is worthy and go to the current owners and say to them, we will refund you 10 years of your property taxes. There will never, ever be any uh, taxes on this piece of property ever again if you register something on title. I think that's the only way we can, we can save them. It has to be done before somebody has the inclination to change it. So no, the, the answer to your question is there is no Ericsson building that is protected. Yes? Uh, when did he visit Galliots and West? How old was he? Um, well, when he saw it, uh, he had just come back from the army, and so he was in his, I would think, mid to late twenties. I don't know when he actually visited it. Did but he ever Frank Lloyd Wright, yes he did, yeah. Do you know what year that was? No, I don't. No. Back to the question, did he uh, participate in the construction site and getting on site? Well, certainly um, in the early projects, which were basically single-family houses, yes, he was very involved. Um, <clears throat> it strikes me as a contract. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, well, he he was, you know, he was a little bit more hands-on there in, into the construction time, um, but then. Um, for the whole time that I knew him, uh, or at least when I met him in the, in the mid-60s, uh, he had uh, five associates who had been students of his at UBC, so they, you know, they had a, a rapport with him, and they basically ran the projects once they got into construction. Um, but he did visit them. I mean, he didn't, he didn't ignore them at that time. I can remember going to Lethbridge University um, probably at, at least three times when when he was there and the construction was going on so but he had you know pretty capable people and and he kept in touch with all the projects continuously yeah any more thank you